All right, hello. Uh, I'd like to call us back for our next and final panel. Oh, I can, I can do this. <laughs> I'm uh, Rory Walsh. I'm a lecturer and research fellow here at the NAM Center for Korean Studies. I'm excited to um, have the honor of introducing our speakers and discussant for this final panel. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Our first speaker, Hyana Kim, is a PhD candidate in theater and drama at Northwestern University who examines the cultural history of advancing democracy in South Korea, uplifting the experiences of women activists and artists. Our second speaker, Ho Soo Kim, is Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island, whose work examines transnational adoption and reproductive politics, and the material processes and cultural practices of social repair at the sites of state and imperial violence in South Korea, Vietnam, and Staten Island. Our third speaker, Liz Park is the Richard Armstrong Curator of Contemporary Art at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh. She has curated exhibits, exhibitions at a wide range of institutions and her research interests include mobility and migration as well as representations of violence in the colonial present. And the discussant for this panel is Dr. Nam Hee Lee, Professor of Modern Korean History in Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Los Angeles and the director of UCLA's Center for Korean Studies. Dr. Lee's most current work explores the socio-cultural history of South Korea since it transitioned away from authoritarianism in the late 1980s. And with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Hyanna Kim. Hello, everyone. My name is Hyanna once again. Thank you, Lori, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Professor Sammy O, oh, Francisco Sanin, for including me in this wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, so uh, this paper that I'm going to present today comes from my dissertation that engages with the Gwangju uprising. And as you all very much likely know, the uprising is known to be one of the most horrific instances of state violence in Korean history. During the uprising, the uh, excuse me, the uprising, the military not only clubbed, bayoneted, eviscerated and opened fire at protesters in broad daylight, but they also abducted dead bodies to dump them in the wild mountains to erase material evidence of their crimes. The estimated of uh, number of death ranges from 600 to 2,000, uh, with the exact number still unascertained um, because the whereabouts of the disappeared are not yet claimed. And, uh, and I assume that that might be the topic that the second presenter Hosu Kim is going to be um, discussing. But despite so many deaths, the uprising also played a key role in bringing about a turn from dictatorship to democracy. And we can find the earliest efforts to make this turn possible. And this is the topic of my talk today, um, which is to look at the vibrant history of commemorative activism in the 1980s. And my title is Yes, Occupying the Graveyard, the Gwangju Mangwaldong Cemetery as Affective Space for Democracy, through which I'll be discussing how a commemoration-centered activism served to undermine the last military dictatorship in Korea. And my starting question is, what kind of transformative politics might be enacted uh, when we use the tools of performance such as protests or public assemblies to grieve the death that might otherwise be erased and jettisoned from history. In answering this question, my paper starts from this newspaper article um, printed in the Tonga Daily in 1986. And I begin by quoting a line, a line that a childless mother gave during the memorial service. My beloved son, over the last six years, I could never lock the front door thinking, what if you come back home alive and walk through the door crying out, mom? On May 18, 1986, a young South Korean mother recited a letter for her dead son. He was one of the numerous victims of the Gwangju uprising. A large crowd of commemorators gathered at the Mangwaldong Cemetery 
a local graveyard for the uprising's victims. The mother continued. Every year, when the anniversary day comes, I climb over this hill of Mangwaldong, a hill that holds so much Han. Here, the Korean word Han means feelings of deep sorrow and resentment that grow over time. By projecting her Han onto the cemetery's hill, she was speaking to her deep grief. For her, May was a cruel month when the new life of early summer and spring reminded her of her loss. Several representatives from domestic and international press were present. A reporter from the Tonga Daily noted how the mother's quavering voice and speech, quote, penetrated people's hearts, end quote. The Boston Globe also presented, uh, reported this event, running a pixelated photo. Yes. Running a pixelated photo, and here we see a weeping mother in a posture of trying to embrace the tomb Extending her right arm to caress the grassy barrier mound, she seems as if she's trying to feel her son's presence underneath the sod. Her arm, stretched between her body and the grave, prompts us to think about the vast distance between life and death, a gap that she cannot close. These sources are important records that show what it looked like for the bereaved family members to hold the memorial service during the last military dictatorship of Korea, Chun Doo-hwan. The Boston Globe article then depicts the violent conflict between the state police and about a thousand people who attended the ceremony, noting that the state arrested 120 people. Why did they arrest them? This was because the ruling, ruling military dictatorship at the time regarded this memorial service as anti-state criminality. The regime, which is known to be extremely authoritarian and fiercely anti-communist, called the pro-democracy protesters pokdo, which literally translates as rioters or thug, but in the context of the 1980s, the term also had a slight or maybe strong connotation of North Korean communists. Hailing protesters in this awful name, the state then also prohibited the mourning the victims in public, punishing violators under the national security law. This then begs a question. Why did these people come together risking such grave state repercussions? In this talk, I explore what kind of transformative politics might arise when, when grief-stricken people appear body to body to stage a massive commemorative public assembly. Scholarship on pro-democracy movements in Korea is robust, however, it has often privileged the voices of male elites based in Seoul. Not to reinscribe this disparity in gender and region, I focus on the works of women activists based locally in Gwangju, especially the childless mothers of the uprising, who I refer to hereafter as the main mothers or oral money. And based on archival research and oral history interviews that I conducted in Korea, I argue that the main mother's activism in the Bangwaldong Cemetery teaches us that a society becomes more democratic when politics derives from grief, an expansive grief in which previously denigrated deaths are publicly mourned and remembered rather than erased from social memories. So to elaborate this a little more, I want to walk you through the Bangwaldong Cemetery, which is the uh, center stage of my paper. Yes, so prologue, the Bangwaldong Cemetery, and Chesa or memorial service activism. So the Mangwaldong Cemetery is known to be known to be one of the most fiercely contested battlegrounds for democracy under the last military dictatorship in Korea. The cemetery that I'm describing is what locals call in the name of Kumyoyak or old gravesite, uh, which existed until um, 1997 when the state built a expanded new May 18 National Cemetery. And here, these photos show both the old and new cemetery on the same slide. And when I asked my interlocutors in Gwangju about how they feel about the new national cemetery, many of them expressed deep nostalgia to the original one. And this profound sense of loss or nostalgia or longing seemed to come from the vibrant history of that accumulated in the old cemetery where the main mothers showed up every year to claim and occupy the graveyard. There, they stage a massive commemorative public assembly with countless fellow citizens in solidarity fighting against the state's ban on mourning. 
And this, uh, re this act of resistance, which began in the year of the dictatorship's, dictatorship's inception in 1980, continued on through the regime's demise in 1987 and repeating every year through today. And at the heart of this reiterative performance is a concept um, that I develop and call Chesa, Chesa activism. Under normal circumstances, Chesa refers to private memorial rights that the family holds on the day of on the day of the death of their beloved. This is a photo of Chesa at the old Mangwaldong. So, all right. So this is the uh, a photo of Chesa at the old Mangwaldong cemetery from an unknown year. And as you can see, one of the key components of each Chesa is this very large table for food offering. And this otherwise private ritual transformed into a powerful public protest when the main mothers decided to bring out the memorial table to the graveyard, refusing to confine their grief into the private realm of their homes. So mostly housewives, these mothers did not hold pre-established political opinions through education or through books, but I believe that this is what makes their commitment more forceful. Um, they fashion themselves into who they are, unflinching pro-democracy activists, um, by engaging themselves in publicly, publicly staging Chesa in the Mangwaldong Cemetery. And when they appeared in public, they embodied their claim by donning the traditional garments, which is called Sobok for memorial rites, which is a long suit of uh, long white flowing skirts and jackets. And this costume indicates their position as the bereaved family members. And the significance of these garments spilled over into places outside the cemetery, as you can see that these mothers carried this sartorial marker as main mothers when they participated in street protests. So in these two photos, we see main mothers standing up to an army of riot police dispatched by the state or marching down the street holding the frames of their beloved in their arms. And May Mothers also amplify the cemetery ceremony's visual and corporeal experience by spectacularizing their protest. For example, in this photo, we see them burning the effigy of Chonduhan. These elements, such as the garments and incinerating spectacles, show that Chesa activism was a set of softly curated events that took on a highly presentational mode to make their indictment of dictatorship more poignant and accessible to the viewers. Framing Jesa as a particular form of activist performance, I define Jesa activism as, power, as a powerful form of commemorative activism by the main mothers that turned grief, which might otherwise have been repressed in the private space to an eminently public affect, thereby providing previously erased death a prominent place in cultural memories. In the course of Chesa activism, the border of private ritual and public protest was made coterminous as the main mothers repurposed their private commemorative ritual into an anti-dictatorship protest. Chesa activism underlines a belief that justice arises through taking responsibility for the dead. In advancing this point, I will now turn to illustrate the historical process through which Chesa activism developed into a powerful form, spotlighting two key events, so the first one is 1980 funeral, and the next, and then the last one will be 1984 rally. So scene one, the 1980 funeral. Following the end of the uprising was a funeral, and many of my interlocutors expressed deep resentment about this funeral. This was not only because the seat dis disrespectfully carried the coffins in bulk in dumpster trucks, but the burial was also unceremonious. Considering the importance of having a proper funeral in Korean culture, with the belief that the dead are finally at peace through a formal ceremony, the fact that they could not have a proper ritual really deeply tormented the families. And this photo here um, shows the immense pathos on that day, capturing the depth of human grief as expressed in the wailings of women stretched over the coffins. You can almost hear the sound from the photo if you try to attune your senses to that. And in contrast, this other photo communicates grief in a completely different way. The silence is deafening among a group of women seated in the overgrown weeds of the cemetery. The second woman from the left, this lady here, her name is Kim Jeom-ne, she's mother of Lee Chang Jae-chul, 
and asked why the victims were taken to the Mang Ortong Cemetery, she told me that the families were given no choice. She said, quote, it was not that we could choose the graveyard day, and by that she means civil servants, just took all the victims and buried them there, end quote. That the families could not lay claim to the funeral remains deeply painful to this day, as Kim Gilja, mother of the late Moon jae told me, quote, after funeral, I came home to be bedridden. For three months, all I ate was water, end quote. What finally energized her into action was her desire to rectify the state's misrepresentation of the uprising as the one instigated by Pokdo. And in an, in an interview, she told me that this pejorative was what made her get out of her sick bed. And I must tell you that having been able to meet with her during my time in Gwangju uh, was one of the most unforgettable ethnographic moments. So I introduced myself as a graduate student, um, researching the uprising, and then she offered to visit her house we, when we had hours and hours of talking and crying and, and just listening to her life stories. And when you meet with her in person, she speaks in such a soft and low voice that it's really hard to imagine that she was the one who was really spearheading a, a, an event like anti-military dictatorship protest. Um, so here I have a chunk of her words, one in English and the other in Korean. And for those of you who have the capacity to, uh, in both of the languages, you will immediately notice that she speaks in distinctive Gwangju dialect, Jeollado dialect. So if you would allow me, I'll try to uh, impersonate her in Korean to my best ability, and then I'll switch back to uh, English. So she said, 물만 먹고도 안 죽습니다. 안 죽어. 그래서 생각을 해본 게 목소리 톤이 생각하는 톤으로 바뀐다. 어째 우리 재학이가 폭도일까? 내가 일하고 있을 때가 아니다. 우리 재학이 폭도 누명을 벗겨야지. 내가 일하고 있을 때가 아니다. 그래 갖고 물을 한잔 드시고 목소리 톤이 원래대로 돌아온다. 내가 일어났어요. 나가서 인자 한나 한나 유족을 끄집어냈어. 한나 끄집어내서 우리 같이 투쟁하자고. 남자들은 너무나 탄압이 심해서 남자들은 함부로 못해. 여자들이 해야지. And now let me read in English. So she said, but it still did not kill me. And by that she meant that she was just eating water, giving herself a starvation. Um, so it still did not kill me. No, this got me to think. Her voice tone then turns inquisitive and contemplative. How come is our Tehak Pukdo? And here, the first person plural possessive is an expression of endearment, our Tehak. Uh, it's not a time for me to stay idle at home. I must clear Tehak's false charge. And then her voice tone returns to her normal tone. So I started going door to door to speak to the bereaved families, persuading them one on one to fight together. The oppression was harsher on men, so it was better for a woman to do it. Here, Kim Gilja articulates that Chesa activism began as an epistemological redress. Having participated in Chesa activism from its inception, she emphasized that when the terms such as Pokdo erased the uprising significance, Kim Gilja and her fellow mothers, wives, and sisters united to redress this violence. And unsurprisingly, conducting Jesa activism entailed massive, massive state repercussions. However, the solidarity of sympathizing citizens also grew in direct proportion to the state's oppression. This led the state to decide to physically destroy the gravesite by enacting what was called the Pigeon Action Plan or Pibulgi Shiheng Gongja. And this is basically to offer money to the families to, to move uh, the grave out of the Mangwoldong Cemetery to somewhere else so that the cemetery will lose its political power. Um, most families uh, fought against this, of course, actively protecting the cemetery. And for example, Kusona, a mother of late Lee Jong-yeon stayed, and this is a really awful story. So Lee Jong-yeon's Jong mother, Kusona, and Moon Jae-yak's mother, um, Kim gil -ja, stood a night watch um, to encounter grave diggers in the middle of the night and asked how she could be so courageous. Kusanak told me, soldiers killed our children. This should go down into history. And what she seemed to articulate by speaking of history, Yoksa, was that dismantling the graveyard was not simply a physical destruction, but rather it was an act of epistemological erasure that jettisoned the death of the victims from public memory, memories that she believed should be passed down to future generations. And 
I uh, wrote about her, her family, and her daughter and her son in a very recent article that, uh, that talks about the theater production that dramatized her story. So it, I might be happy to share that article with you if you're more curious. All right, so scene two, the 1984 rally of watershed moment. So such tenacity by the uh, main mothers to, to protect the cemetery led to a watershed moment such as the 1984 rally attracting an estimated total of 3,000 attendants. And this year's activism, TESA activism, was even more special because it was the first time when the injured survivors of the uprising who had been hospitalized or who had been sick over years uh, finally got the, uh, their health back to, to be able to join the ceremony. And their appearance in public was significant not only because they were displaying the uh, evidence of state's horrific violence through their bodies, but also because they really broke what theater scholar David Roman describes as the horizon of expectations that disabled or injured bodies are not capable of meaningful political actions. And this photo here shows um, uh, another uh, moment of the 1984 rally, which I view as really capturing the heart of TESA activism. So when I show this photo to Chun ge who is the former president of the Association of the Gwangju Uprising's bereaved family uh, during the time of Chun Doo Han, um, he told me that this photo was the commemorators on their way coming out of the cemetery. And he also added that the people in wheelchairs at the fr forefront of the march were those who were injured from the uprising and those who were wearing sobo while, while white garments are families of the victims and following them are the participants in solidarity walking along the winding path unpaved and dusty in the low mountainside of the Mangwardong Cemetery. And when I found this photo, it immediately prompted me to think of it as a scene that shows a loose but powerful group choreography where people share the, their deep grief in an affectively voluminous space created only for a duration of the march, but the experience of which would really remain indelible, reshaping their understanding of what a democracy should look like or how it could feel like. And in this unhurried procession in which the wheelchair users set the pace of the march by walking with their arm power, an exchange of support and care occurs providing an opportunity not only to remember the death, but also to understand the meanings of survivorship and allyship in the aftermath of the massive violence. And one might argue that the site specificity of TESA activism is counterintuitive because the very site to draw their political power from, which is cemetery, is ostensibly a site of negativity, loss, or disappearance. Um, However, I believe that through Jessa activism, this graveyard became a place to imagine and rehearse a different future. And such interpretation is directly informed by a speech of Chun ge during the 1984 rally, where, she, where he uh, gave this beautiful line. He said, today is a day of sorrowful commemorative rights of democracy in which those are gone and those are left come together in one place to evaluate the present condition, make a resolution towards tomorrow, thereby uniting us in solidarity that transcends the divide of life and death. He's a powerful writer. And this speech shows that the commemorators understood the Mangwardong Cemetery as a liminal interspace where the divide of life and death is momentarily suspended, leading them to reflect on how to move forward to forge a different future. And in the subsequent years, TESA activism continued on, leading to transformative moments such as the 1980 June Revolution, which finally ended the military dictatorship in Korea. But I believe that it's a discussion for later to debate whether the meaning of democracy was fully uh, fulfilled through this uh, revolution in 1987. Um, as a way to close my talk, I believe that the significance of this history really reverberates across the geographical confines of Korea, since the question of which death count and whose lives matter are not exclusive to Korea. 
And to recall Jeon Gye Ryang's 1984 speech, we might say that the commemorative activism considered here encourages, encourages us to be attentive to an ongoing global politics of mourning, one that encompasses those who are gone and those who are left. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, Tunam Center and Tatman College and Professor Oh and Professor Sanin and also Professor um, Ryu and for organizing and, and making this wonderful conference. And also Ivan and tech staff and who facilitate this you know, hybrid format so uh, without trouble. And uh, thank you for, you know, as a last <laughs> sort of panel, I also want to thank all of you to bring uh, you know, beautiful and very insightful and hard work and to the table, and I feel so inspired. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge that we are standing on a ceded territory of the traditional and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, uh, and also I want to acknowledge the you know cleaning staff and landscape workers and food preparation, preparation workers uh, that make the, making this environment smoothly and also very welcoming possible. So today's paper, uh, which I originally titled The City of the Disappeared, and I rename it City of the Missing. And I want to work, uh, walk you all through why. As of December 2018, official statistics for the 10 days from Gwangju massacre include 165 dead, 5,568 uh, arrested and wounded, five unidentified, 84 disappeared. Yet this state sanctioned number for the disappeared is only a fraction of the total reported missing, which has ranged from 242 to 448 missing. This gulf in the number that have been claimed to be missing and its official count points inconsistency in accounting for the missing, which depend on stakeholders' perspectives and their very variegated methods. The fact that conservative es estimate of the missing is still greater than the total number of the dead denotes political and historical uh, significance of disappeared and inconclusive nature of the state reparations for the Gwangju democratization movement. In January 2020, Special Act on the Investigating Truth of the May 18 democratization movement created the commission, Truth Commission, to conduct a two-year investigation. Standing in the defense of historic truth and against the falsification and distortion of the Gwangju movement, which has come, attack, come under special attack on, due to the upsurge of the ultra-right wing, and its mission is to investigate the chain of the command regarding who gave the orders of the fire and determine what kind of uh, human rights violations occurred and the location of the secret burial sites of the disappeared. Under the banner of, quote, political, political neutrality, objective, objectivity of facts, and scientific rationality, the commission emphasized the search for truth as a catalyst to bring about reconciliation and prevent reoccurrence, recurrence. The parameter for its investigation into the missing are therefore delimited identifying mass killing incidents and locations of the secret site, secret burial sites. The truth the Commission's investigation of the disappeared in pursuit of the forensic truth discovery resembles TRCK, in which was launched in 2005. Kim Dong-chun, a sociologist and the chief commissioner of the TRCK, pointed that main activities of the TRCK unidirectionally focused on especially uh, establishing the forensic truth with a little specifics about how and with whom the TRCK was promote reconciliation. The Elijah dictates itself as if reconciliation is only possible through truth. To this historic narrative of truth and reconciliation, Yang Ju Ryu cogently observes as follows, quote, where truth may actually hinder reconciliation. What is the price of insisting on truth without reconciliation and of implementing reconciliation without truth? Attentive, 
attentiveness to this question might allow us to reframe reconciliation not as the natural consequence of the establishing truth, inconvertibly and once for and for all, but as an agonizing attempt to close the gap between truth and injustice. Guided by the political imperative of truth keeping and truth finding over the disappeared, I reframed the disappeared as missing, refigured the disappeared into missing, and reimagined missing as an analytic with which to bear witness to unscrupulous violence of Gwangju and to imagine a politics repaired from the unhealable, irreparable wounds. While it is very likely that many of the disappeared are dead, I propose to pay attention to the varied figures and unconfirmed state of the disappeared and explore the category as an epistemological realm and call for disruptive imagination of missing, including both, both those claimed and unclaimed. This, first, the Korean words for the disappeared. Disappeared and the vanished in Gwangju is referred as hengbulja and or shilchongja. The main parts of the each term, hengbangbulmyeong and shilchong, function as modifiers and are compounded with suffix cha, making the disappeared and vanished into a person. Hengbangbulmyeong and shilchong denotes a state of unknowing regarding the disappeared whereabouts, making the speaker the subject who acts either by inquiring about the object that disappeared or by initiating a search. In these terms, disappeared is only legible as an object of inquiry and exists in its passive, immobile, and inanimate state of, inanimate state of being, more like a death-like state. In her grounding, groundbreaking work, uh, Ghostly Matters, Avery Gordon observes that disappeared uh, disappeared in Latin America as a site where our modality of knowing and should be brought into question and where alternative mode of knowledge production must be sought. While acknowledging humanitarian needs and political efficacy of efforts to produce credible and legitimate claims to, be dis to, to the disappeared, Gordon suggests that adherence of the such efforts to standards of truth, visible evidence of injury, impartiality, objectivity, authenticated witness, inevitably precludes ambiguity, pre complicity, imagination, may lead to oblivion of how state terror is so involved in sense-making and knowledge-making, the knowledge of disappearance. In assessing uncontainable, ungraspable nature of the disappeared, Gordon argues for a mo new mode of inquiry into disappearance that treats a complex system of repression as a thing in, in itself. Gordon's lucid engagements of disappearance is not that recalibrates our cognition and sensoria to not only think and feel disappeared as an after effect of the state corporeal violence, but also to consider the state's epistemic violence as a mechanism vital to the maintenance of the disappeared. I argue the term disappeared itself may implicate in such violence by equating the disappeared as dead or non-being. Despite a repressive environment, however, the disappeared emerges without permission, traveling to the present in a variety of shapes, sounds, and stories. Gordon describes such returns as ghostly, following her invitation of disruptive and speculative approach to the disappeared as a fulcrum of knowledge production. I interpret the ghostly return of the disappeared by piecing together news articles, TV news, and my ethnography of Gwangju in the past summer. But to step away from overwhelming sensoria and thoughts of the disappeared instantly register as dead or non-being, I employ missing, a term that is infused with action as opposed to a state of being. In its gerund form, missing embodies multiple senses, a sense of failure, sense of loss and sadness, and foremost, sense of unstopping desire to see, to feel, to know the disappeared. Thus the term missing, as Mel Chen might argue, reanimates the languid passive or non-being disappeared into shimmering matters and its potent agencies. And I wonder, how might missing as a linguistic reclaiming act suggest a new method of seeing and sensing the disappeared?
In May 2021, during a month when commemoration of Oirpal rain, uh, ranged from state-led official ceremony to the street parade, draping the city and dragging the city back to May 8, 1980, two stories of missing emerged, backing a transformative recognition of missing. The first one returns in archival footage, then reappears in a photo exhibit. Archival footage it captured originally by BBC shows shows a group of arrested protesters sitting on a bus taken into the military custody on the last day of the uprising. Among the arrested and is a child who looks too young to be in a school. In footage, the child is looking around the bus, out the window, and holding and munching on a snack. The same child appears once again in a photo exhibit uh, 2021, put forth by the Committee for Restoration of the Jeonnam Municipal Building, taken by Thor Norman Thorpe, American photojournalist for the Wall Street Journal at the time. The photograph was taken the same day as the, as the footage. is focused on the same group of the arrested, the protesters. Through the bus window, the photograph faintly captures silhouettes of the child sitting on the lap of arrested passenger. Upon the release of the photo, Lee Sang-ho, now a professor of the social work in Mokpo City, City Tech, came forward identifying himself the one who was holding the child in his arms. According to Lee, he received the child from a high school student arrested on the May 27th and was taken with the child to the military base where all the arrested were interrogated, tortured, and incarcerated for months. There, the child was turned over the military. Quote, behind my closed eyes, the child's face appeared. How could I not remember him? I've been wondering, is he living or dead? Where is he? He lamented. Yet he also acknowledged that he had never spoken a word about the child for fear of that no one would believe him. In the same month, Gwangju MBC a broadcasting company aired the news that self-claimed missing man, 51 years old, Jo Young-un, filed his case to be reviewed by the Truth Commission. Back in May 1980, Jo then 10 years old, left his house in search of his mother, who was working at the time in a municipal building. He wound up hiding in the street for days, away from the military squad. Cho described his experience, quote, Caught in the crossfire, I was searching for a place to hide around the municipal building, finally in the parked bus. Suddenly, the door of the slung opened. The two soldiers climbed up, threatening to shoot if I didn't surrender my, by the count of three. So he came out of hiding and was taken to the US mil, uh, Korean military base in Songjongni, where he escaped a week after and boarded a bus for Seoul. Cho was then institutionalized and grew up in closed off facilities in Seoul and Busan. Soon after a special hearing of the Gwangju massacre in 1988, Joe's father reported his son's missing and Ministry of the Internal Affair kept the record of his father's report. However, city government reviewed his case in 89 and 93, dismissed it both times. Based on the testimonies from family members, a third party, and himself, the city government granted the fact that he was missing. However, his claim was dismissed on the ground of following grounds. One, a, clear, uh, a lack of clear evidence that corroborates the time of his disappearance with the Gwangju uh, democratization movement period from 18 to the 27th of May. Second, a lack of military records of the arrest and incarcerations that identify his existence and experience under custody. The review committee concluded that Joe's experience was not part of arrest, but of an instance of, quote, protection, protection and care, end quote. After Joe's disappearance, conflict tore apart his family, his father and his older sister went searching for him. His younger sister, then four years old, staying home alone until the neighbor reported it to the official who took her to the orphanage in Hwasun. She stated that without Gwangju, without his disappearance, her family would have stayed together. 
May 21, observed the ghostly returns of the dis disappeared in Gwangju, one in the form of photograph that cuts out the contour of the missing child. The second, the, the other, is a return of the missing person alive in his 50s. Both cases pointed remainder of the missing and making clear the limits of the rubric of the state recognition. Remaining outside, the ghostly return of the photographed child and Cho's return as a missing person serves what Gina Kim put as an insurgent force that reminds a unhealable wounds and unresolved grief left in the wake of a state violence and un countercurrent the normative state narrative of violence, healing, and reconciliation. End quote. Analyzing their return as a defiant act that dispute the disappeared as dead. I'd like to see how and where insurgent forces of missing leads and how we can think with missing about the politics of repair. The photographed child not only legitimates Professor Lee's repressed memories, but activates his and many others. A citizen in their 50s claimed that the child resembled his disappeared younger brother who was at the time seven years old. Another, another citizen claimed that photograph, photographed was himself. A third person came forward with his recollection. He was arrested on this 27, but three days later was released with a seven years old child. Of all, Professor Lee, as a last witness to the child, speculates on the connection between the child's disappearance and the youngest martyr, namelessly buried at the Oil Pal National Cemetery. According to the medical record of the corpse, the body was estimated to be four years old and was determined to have died between 23rd and 28th, 1980, May of 1980. The cause of death was excessive loss of blood from bullet wound on the left and rear side of his neck. But then, recent disclosure of military marshal's testimony disputes an alleged connection between missing child and the youngest martyr by providing the discrepancy of the date of the death. The ghostly return of the photographed child evoked a cascade of the speculations from witnesses bystanders, the family of the disappeared, and the disappeared, all of which invoked the multiple possibilities of the child's whereabouts. Imagine both into death and the life disrupt accounting of the disappeared as a dead. The cacophony of inquiries and claims and testimonies that follow the ghostly return of the photographed child turns the disappeared into a missing child for whom the collective yearns to find out his life or death and stories. Rendering disappeared into missing reiterates the performative utterance of missing and thereby transforms the affects that attends to the disappeared. Furthermore, the Joe's return and reclaiming act of his own missing demands us to reset our sensorium of the disappeared. Thinking about affective texture of the missing, I offered a reading of Joe's return, which hardly received any follow-up media coverage. Looking at the photographed child, and self-claimed missing individual on the news side by, side by side, strikingly informs the child and the man in his 50s were only a few years apart from each other at the time of the disappearance. This generates another optics of missing in a temporal register. Spanning over 41 years, these ghostly returns of the missing gesture toward each other as if Cho and the photographed child approximate the past and the future of the each other. The specular reading of the returns as a speculative reading into the child's otherwise benign and innocent photograph and illuminates life-crushing moments and its consequential contortion of life path and impossible recoveries thereafter. But foremost, what captivates my attention was the loss, the loss of time from and to the reference of the photograph. Surfacing time as a loss incisively denotes unhealable wounds and irreparable, irreparable grief of Gwangju. Not only did Cho miss time, but as recounted by Cho's sister, this instance of missing left her homeless. The missing destroys her family too. An essay collection called Gonman Pado Sarapko Kriun Nalder details how bereaved family members of the missing have a high incidence of premature death, 
developmental development of the psychological debilitation to domestic violence, addiction, and derailment of the, their lives too. The victims and their bereaved families have missed time to live as well as possible and have experienced a traumatic rupture in their own and their families' lives. What can make up for the lost time? Time from families, friends, or mundane ordinary life from themselves. Is it possible to retrieve lost time? What is the proper equivalent of lost time? In what ways can we make amends for lost time? I have arrived to these set of questions by following the traces of the ghostly returns. And I'm wondering, missing, in epistemological, affective, and political insurgent forces help to reclaim and reanimate the disappeared in volatile but fertile ground to foster a new mode of inquiry, a politics for repair. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to be a part of this discussion and the uh, presentations that have come before me to create this very rich context for um, uh, the work of Im Hung Soon and Han Gang, which I will um, dive into in my presentation. Um, I will begin by um, sharing with you this epigraph. After all, while the victors of history have long erected monuments to remember their triumphs and victims have built memorials to recall their martyrdom, only rarely does a nation call on itself to remember the victims of crimes it has perpetrated. Where are the national monuments to the genocide of American Indians, to the millions of Africans enslaved and murdered, to the gulags and peasants starved to death by the millions? I begin with this quote by cultural theorist James E. Young to consider the difficult task undertaken by two Korean practitioners Im Hung Sun and Han Gang. How does a country remember its own crimes who are called upon to remember the atrocities committed by the leaders of a country? Im Hung Sun is best known for a factory complex or Wido Gong Dan in Korean. Um, his 2014 documentary of the struggles of South Korean women laborers and Han Gang is the author of the novel Human Acts, published in the same year, 2014, which provides a multi-perspectival narrative of the 1980 Gwangju uprising. In their respective work, they have dealt with the subject of the various subjects of censorship, torture, military-led massacres of civilians in 20th century Korea. As visual and literary artists, Im and Han are deeply concerned with not only storytelling, but whose stories are heard in a, sto in a society that has attempted to sanitize history through state-controlled textbooks. It is a widely known fact that Han was among a long list of cultural figures who were blacklisted during former President Park Geun-hye's tenure. Thus, the stakes are high when leading voices in contemporary Korean culture have an international platform for disseminating their work and finding new audiences for the kinds of narratives that uncover the country's deepest hypocrisies and crimes. I had the honor of working with Im and Han as associate curator of the 2018 Carnegie International, which is a contemporary art survey exhibition hosted every five years at Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, a post-industrial American city with complex layers of labor history. They were first time collaborators who knew each other only by reputation and were introduced to one another by myself and the curator I was working with, Ingrid Schaffner. Im and Han converged on a couple of, point, uh, couple of important areas of investigation. One, the historical traumas of the Korean Peninsula and two, the work of women in political movements. The pair immediately began discussing the connection between Han's native city of Gwangju and Buenos Aires, Argentina. 
serendipitously, both had visited Argentina on a previous occasion and were struck by the movement of mothers who publicly protested the disappearance of their children during the Videla di dictatorship from 1976 to 1981. Up to 30,000 political dissidents are suspected to have been disappeared during this time. And since 1977, the mothers have been marching in the Plaza de Mayo, which faces the presidential palace Casa Rosada in a statement of defiance, demanding that they know what has happened to their children. The two artists drew connections between mothers of the Plaza de Mayo with May Mothers, a group that formed in light of the indiscriminate massacre of Guangzhou residents by the military led by then de facto leader, Zhang Duhan. For these two leading cultural figures in South Korea, the activism of mothers in Buenos Aires provided an opportunity to reframe the historical trauma of Guangzhou democratization movement. In the poem titled Winter Through a Mirror by Han Gang, which was included as a series of prints in the Carnegie International, she teases out this relationship. And I'm going to share with you a couple of excerpts from the poem. Now my city is spring morning. If you pass through the core of the earth, bore through the middle, straight and unerring, that city appears. The time there, exactly 12 hours behind. The season, exactly half a year behind. So that city is now an autumn evening as though silently following someone that city follows behind mine. To cross over the night, to cross over winter, I wait silently while my city outruns that city like somebody silently overtaking. They said we would fly for an entire day, tightly fold 24 hours, pop them in your mouth and go into the mirror, they said. Once I unpack in a room in that city, I should take time to wash my face. If the suffering of this city silently overtakes, I will silently lag behind. And when you are not peering at it for a moment, lean against the frosty back of the mirror and hum carelessly. Until having tightly folded 24 hours and spat it out, nudged with your hot tongue, you return and peer at me. 12 hours ahead, halfway around the world, opposite seasons. Im and Han use these coincidental relationships to tether the two cities and draw out a commonality. The moral authority of mothers in an immoral context of a military state. They present motherhood as an arena of politics where women take on the role of public witnesses who pass down historical narratives that are not sanctioned by the state. Yet it would be reductive to say that their work is about motherhood or their project is a feminist revi revisionism because the works that Im and Han convey, the works by Im and Han convey a complex and nuanced cultural and sociopolitical landscape. And there lies another important point of convergence in their artistic approach, which is they both rely on and put forward a polyphonic testimony. For example, uh, Hans Human Acts is organized as a series of chapters, each narrated from the perspective of someone involved directly or indirectly in Guangzhou uprising. The first chapter introduces the character Dong Ho, a teenage boy who was shot by the paratroopers who have taken over Guangzhou. He haunts the memories of other characters in subsequent chapters, including his own aging mother, as she reflects on the immediate period following his death, when she becomes politicized along with other women who have lost their children. Other characters include an editor facing censorship in the 1980s Korea during, uh, un under Jun Duhan, and survivors tormented by memories of torture. The testimonies that Han presents through her characters are pained and vulnerable, personal and political. Her work shares the sensitivity and the power of frank statements that also characterize Im's work. In his factory complex, 
M revisits the history of the so-called economic miracle of South Korea from the perspective of women laborers. The laborers that he begins his film with are primarily young women who work for pittance in textile factories. He then turns his camera to present day women workers who must perform emotional labor as flight attendants, call center employees, grocery store clerks. And finally, he traveled to Cambodia to capture the conditions of textile factory workers there who are young women who work long hours for little compensation with no promise of class mobility. For the Carnegie International, in addition to featuring their respective work as individual artists, they prepared a collaborative presentation that invited viewers into their research and thinking process. One of the works they presented is this two channel video installation titled Dream Conversation, in which Im and Han share the personal toll it took to bear the difficult knowledge that they've been working with. At one point in their dialogue, Han shares how she went through her old diaries, which were inscribed with two questions she wrote to herself as a constant reminder. How can the present help the past? How can the living help the dead? In those statements, I see the artist's desire to listen to not only the living, but the dead, to look at the now, but also the past, and to look at oneself while looking at the other. To this end, the concept of the mirror was effectively deployed by these two artists throughout the exhibition to reorient the speaking subject as also the listener and the observer. Im and Han presented their work in a series of three connected rooms. In the first room, uh, Im presented his two channel video installation titled Good Light, Good Air which refers to Guangzhou, which literally translates to state or province of light in Buenos Aires, which means good air. The two screens were facing each other, presenting stories from interviewees in Argentina on one side and those from Korea on the other, putting the viewer in the middle to reflect on the symmetries of these two military states. In the middle chamber, Dream conversation was presented. You can see that on the foreground here. If you can see my cursor, along with Han's poems, Winter Through a Mirror, at the back here, and archival materials, and the results of workshops that Han and Im conducted with high school students, which you can't see in the photograph, but is on the opposite side. And in the last room, Han presented a two channel video installation, I Do Not Bid Farewell, where she and another woman run through a forested landscape to reach a rocky coastline with this long span of cloth between them and the performance of mourning. Together, these components presented Hans and Im's work in dialogue with room to invite others. They were not presenting a singular perspective through their art but making space and time for a conversation between themselves and between two cities. What does it mean for cities to be in conversation? Who speaks and listens? And what silences mark the conversation? For this presentation, I am focusing on mothers as speakers in the two artists' work because of their active decision to take up space and visibility as a way to call attention to their children who were murdered or disappeared. Questions about memory keeping and history writing are at the heart of Im's and Han's practice, and mothers in their work take up a unique position as stewards of memory. In good light, good air, a mother of the Plaza de Mayo shares her reasons for her participation in the decades long ongoing marches by saying that she comes to the plaza to meet her disappeared child every week. As for the May mothers of Guangzhou, as we have heard in Hyanna Kim's uh, presentation, they 
regularly organize uh, what I think is a lovely um, and powerful uh, terminology, Chesa uh, activism. Uh, Im's uh, video captures, this is a still image from Im's video, um, captures a group of elderly women wearing vests that say, enact law to criminalize falsification of May 18, which we heard uh, about from uh, Hosu Kim's presentation. The May mothers take to the streets in memory of their lost children while calling for an acknowledgement of the criminal conduct by the military. This act of claiming a public space as a place where the living conjure the dead and the dead comfort the living is a powerful manifestation of the cultural theorist Bell Hooks's notion of home place. Both a physical and symbolic space, Hooks's home place is where Black women seek refuge, restore dignity, and set an intentional practice of care and nurturance in a hostile white world. Importantly, Hooks describes home place as a space where individuals can, quote, confront the issue of humanization. Although Hooks limits the discussion of home place to a black domestic space in a white colonial state of the United States, the role that women play in creating this kind of space of care and politics are evident in other contexts of oppression, such as the military dictatorship of the 1970s Argentina and the 1980s South Korea. An important distinction that Hooks makes in her argument about home place is that not all women who remain at home are by default home, uh, makers of home place and that it is a choice and a practice to make this space. It is also important to not romanticize motherhood and to acknowledge at times harmful ways that women come to practice care for their children. In Good Light, Good Air, one of the interviewees in Buenos Aires describes her experience of returning to her family after being released from imprisonment and torture. She describes how her family, ecstatic to see her return through a party for the neighborhood, and two days later, her mother turned to her to declare you were in Miami as though she was taking a long vacation. The statement of finality and denial from her mother continues to pain the survivor and underscores the importance of remembering when history is at once a living memory and a, when a closure from a violent past remains a distant promise. If making a home place is an intentional practice, how this Home place can take root outside of a house or other domestic settings, provides opportunities to think about the nature of care as it relates to healing, remembering, and history. The home place where women create both self-affirming and political spaces of struggle is not only a project of healing and collectivizing, but it is also an immense undertaking that redefines memorialization and monument building in a given city. The instability of memories and human frailty as embraced by Im and Han become the foundation of a different kind of public memorial that has the capacity to endure, shape shift and be passed down in generations. Thus the Plaza de Mayo and Mangotong Cemetery as discussed by Haiyan Kim are places of living memory rather than a forgotten memorial. In Good Light, Good Air, a May mother grieves as she says that her son who died too young has left no children of his own. So who will remember him after she's gone? The mothers thus collectively make a place for not only the memory of specific children, but for the human capacity and the strength it takes to remember. Let's return to Young's epigraph that meditates on the nature of monuments. He wrote, only rarely does a nation call on itself to remember the victims of crimes it has perpetrated. His important essay, which was written in 1992, uh, um, uh, to reflect on this 30 years later, uh, we have heated discussions around monuments to historical figures who have perpetrated grave acts of violence that are taking place everywhere. Today, along with those debates and actions taken against such statues of 
former politicians, generals, and conquerors, there's an increased awareness and a desire to change not only what we remember, but how we remember. And in these two artists' work, there's a recognition that there is no closure and that the work of remembering must, must be an ongoing project that is alive and intergenerational. And to conclude, I'd like to return to the dream conversation and the questions that Han asked can the living help the dead and the present help the past? Her conclusion, she shares, was that after completing her novel, Human Acts, it was in fact that the dead who were helping the living and the past who were helping the present. And Im also shares a dream that he had while he was working on a film about Jeju uprising of 1948. And in his dream, he met his grandfather from Jeju, whom Im never got to meet in real life, because he was among tens of thousands who were murdered by the South Korean government under the flimsy excuse of keeping out communists. Im was curious to hear from his grandfather about his experiences, so he asked uh, about, um, about his experiences and his grandfather's answer in his dream was, what will you give me in return? And taken aback by this unexpected question, Im thought for a while and said, a part of my life. What does it mean to share your life with the dead? I think of it as a desire to make space for what has happened in the past as a way to understand the present, to look at oneself and the other. And this is perhaps what the conversation between the two cities can facilitate, the ability to look at oneself and the other as though through a mirror where we see the struggles of the present and the past at once. Thank you. Um, it's truly, um, an honor to be part of this uh, inspiring conference and to be a discussion and moderator for the three very powerful and thought-provoking and deeply uh, nuanced papers. The three papers are also, they work together amazingly well. I know that Albert has already taken that line from me, uh, but I assure you, and I'm sure you've already uh, noticed that um, it is really the case. Um, with this panel as well. So as a way to introduce one of the main themes of the panel, I'd like to begin with an anecdote. I had an opportunity to visit ESMA Memory Site Museum in Buenos Aires in the summer of 2017. It is the building that used to house the Officers Club of Navy, where between 1976 and 1983, the military kidnapped, tortured, and disappeared uh, more than 5,000 men and women. Now it's a museum that houses a collection of survivors' testimonies gathered by the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons and, during the, and also the uh, testimonials uh, collected during the trial of the Juntas and documents declassified by state agencies. The museum guide pamphlet that I picked up at the entrance has three words on the cover, memory, truth, and justice. I thought of these words as I was reading the papers. The May mothers of Gwangju, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, the artist Im Hong Sun, and novelist Han Gang, and the presenters in the panel as scholars and curators are stewards of memory, as Liz Bach put it so succinctly, doing the work of, again, memory making or memory keeping and history making or history writing. All three authors are also engaged in what I like to call poetics of remembrance against the politics of time. The politics of time is a practice that performatively treats as past or anachronistic all those phenomena that do not conform to the contemporary society's dominant idea. This vision of temporality that sets the past against the present and the future has a specific function that of vindicating contemporaries in relation to injustice, 
that happened in the past, as well as in relation to a present that has not rendered justice to past historical injustice. We have seen how this politics of time operates both in scholarship, more specifically in the recent New Rice scholarship, and also most egregiously in the form of public denunciation and humiliation of victims and the family members by elements of the right in South Korea. There are ongoing cases of humiliating and tormenting victims and their families for their activities related to various redress movements. They range from the act of vandalism on and the demands to get rid of the comfort woman statues to the demands to reveal the names of recipients of compensation for victims of Gwangju massacre. And more recently, the case of a group of people gorging out on fried chicken and pizza in front of fasting bereaved families of the Sewol Ferry tragedy who were waging a hunger strike to push for a bill to establish a fact-finding commission. They are also told that the past is past and to move on. Furthermore, they are scorned for being obsessive and unseemly for their unwillingness to be silent. But for these families, the past is still in the present. For the May mothers of Gwangju, mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, even after more than 40 years, the death or the disappearance of their children cannot be consigned to the past. As Lynch, Liz Park mentioned, one mother of the Plaza de Mayo says, she comes to Plaza to meet her disappeared child every week. For these mothers, the past, present, and future are not discrete, separate, or mutually exclusive entities. So the conjunction between the past and present, where there is a deep and abiding connection between the past and the present, especially a connection between the injustice committed in the past and the emancipatory possibility of the present, is what I like to call poetics of remembrance, the following Walter Benjamin's notion of history as remembrance. In the poetics of remembrance, the past does not lie in inert states, passively waiting to be uncovered. The past is not to be understood as an object to be known, but as a subject, an active partner in the construction of meaning. And I believe Ho Su Kim's reframing of the disappeared as the missing is a beautiful example of the giving the subjecthood back to the dis disappeared as it were, uh, which is also a very powerful form of remembrance. And Hayana Kim discusses how grief as a public performance is also a form of remembrance. In Liz Park's discussion, Hangang's human act, as some of you may already know, is a translation of the Korean title, Sonyeonyi Onda. That Sonyeon is already dead, but Onda is in present tense. In one of the interviews conducted in May of this year, after the screening of the film that Im Hong Sun made, which is based on the exhibition, Good Light and Good Air, uh, Im Hong Sun talked about how he felt as he was making this uh, film, um, as if he took up a role of shaman, who during a shamanic ritual, step on a long sword and dance to lead the dead safely to the next world. So another common underlying theme of these papers is notion of truth that implicitly troubles the usual equation uh, too often made of the truth with, with facts. Ever since the Gwangju uprising, it has been shown that providing more facts, more empirical research does not necessarily resolve the issue of how individuals, historians and society as a whole should regard past injustice such as the case of the victims of Gwangju massacre. New and more facts, while promoting further 
historical discourses and historical awareness do not by themselves lead to truth, not least because there is a lack of a rule of judgment, as philosopher Jean-Francois Bertol uh, discusses in a different context, that one can equitable, equitably, equitably resolve conflicting interpretations of different sides. In his different, Leotard develops a very powerful argument of how the empirical demonstration of facts in the case of the denial of the Holocaust further drowns out the pain and anguish of the victims that in contrast to litigation, the wrongs experienced by the victims cannot be presented adequately. A victim is not just someone who has been wronged, but someone who has also lost the power to present this wrong. So when the um, issues such as the Gwangju are pushed strictly as a historiographical issue in terms of historical facts alone, history becomes homogeneous empty time, a sequence of events like the beads of a rosary growing longer as it amasses more and more empirical facts without redemptive potential. So the question becomes, how do we engage with the past that for the victims of the injustice is not and cannot remain a part of the past without getting mired in hopelessness and negativity, but in a way that brings the society together to work toward a horizon of possibility and hope to be able to envision a shared emancipatory present and future. The importance of engaging with the past is also for the living because of the suffering and pain of the past generation is not limited to the victims of injustice, but also extends to immediate families, friends, neighbors, and to the anguish of the entire society, as in the case of what Grace Jo calls transgenerational haunting in her haunting the Korean diaspora. So all these three papers deal implicitly in different ways with poetics of remembrance that also insist that fulfilling the moral obligation of the present for the past is crucial for society to attain true emancipation, which has also been crucial for recent scholarly attempts to think through the issue of retribution of or restitution of historical injustice. To seek retrospective justice for the victims of past injustice does not have to lead to negative effects. That is retrospective measures such as reparation for the victims of past wrongdoings or nation's admission of its own guilt does not have to become, does not have to come at the cost of future oriented politics or utopian and emancipatory visions for the future. And I wondered, um, because I have to obviously uh, play the role of a, of a discussion here, um, if the authors would be willing to expand their discussion of their respective topics to think about emancipatory potential of their work. Ho Su Kim implicitly suggests how her effort to reframe the disappeared as missing as an analytic uh, with which to bear witness to the violence of Gwangju and to imagine a politics of repair from unbearable and unhealable wounds. Uh, I wonder if, if Hosu, you would be, uh, you would elaborate on this notion of politics of repair a bit further. And for Hayana as well, I wonder if you would be willing to elaborate further the notion of transformative politics that you introduced earlier in your, in your presentation that is strengthened when society remembers rather than erases certain memories. Um, I am thinking of this in, in, in especially since uh, post-1987 South Korea uh, with the retreat of authoritarianism, the democratization movements, emancipatory and egalitarian aspirations have become somewhat eligible or obscured um, in the present. 
Um, Liz, um, you concluded with how Han Gang follows up with an answer to her own questions. Um, that is the can the living help the dead and the present help the past. And you suggest that her conclusion uh, was that the dead was helping the living and the past was helping the present. And I was wondering if you would be able to share your thoughts or your understanding of how this is the case, both in Han Gang's novel and her participation in the 2018 Carnegie International. Thank you. Um, perhaps also, um, uh, perhaps I should also read uh, some of the questions because given the quality of questions that were raised in the in the other uh, panels, uh, I really do would like I would like to make sure that we uh, respond to the questions that are raised from the floor. So um, again and again, um, my questions are not necessarily to be responded right away. Uh, so. Um, you're welcome to obviously respond, but uh, let me um, actually um, read out the questions that are posed uh, to Liz, two questions from ji Hun Kim. How do you see the follow-up works of both Han and Im after their collaboration for the Carnegie exhibition, as well as the collaborators' impact on the works uh, for Han? She recently published a new novel, I Do Not Be Farewell, uh, this is about Han's exploration of April the third instant, which is the main subject of Im Hung Sun's future length documentary, uh, Jeju Prayer, that you curiously did not discuss, curiously did not discuss in your presentation. The second question is how do you see the intergenerational, transnational, post-memory transmission of the memory of the violence in both Gwangju and Buenos Aires, which is importantly featured in the future length documentary version of Good Life, Good Air, a transmission evidence by the exchange workshops between the female teenagers of both cities for understanding their mutual history of trauma and violence. Thanks. Um, so thank you, thank you so much, Nami, for um, a really amazing um, way to bring all of our discussions together and to, again, um, create a, a platform and a context which I think of as curatorial work in uh, what I do. Um, and uh, I think that is also part of what Han Gang was trying to say when she says uh, that it was in fact that the dead was helping the living and the past was helping the present. As uh, an artist who, and a writer who relies on research and past testimony and to um, bring, to be able to understand the perspective of somebody whose voice she is inhabiting and articulating in her work. Um, it's important for her to um, be able to think about in what context and under what um, mental state and political circumstance the speaking subjects are articulating their thoughts. Um, and I will uh, maybe share an example um, that comes from the dream conversation uh, piece. Um, she also talks about having read this one testimony by um, somebody who was uh, murdered during uh, May 18, um, and he uh, wrote in his diary before his participation in um, the protest, dear God, why have you given me a conscience? You know, he, he was talking about how he could have just stayed home, but he chose not to. And um, Han Gang talks about this as the moment when she realized that she is not just looking at victims. Mm -hmm. And the moment that she realized the agency of the people who were part of the democracy, democratization movement, and to realize that she herself needed to reframe her um, position in a conversation with the living and the dead. So that is mm -hmm. one very particular example of how the dead was helping the, the, the living. 
um, and the past was helping the present because we have to have an ongoing relationship with the, the present. Um, and for her, this is also a way to share with the larger public. And um, I'll uh, also address Jinan's question. Um, what you see uh, on the level of the exhibition, that is, to me as a curator, uh, is the tip of the iceberg, right? Like the, the part that we share with um, the public in a museum or gallery um, and the work that, and we want that to be um, compelling and beautiful and uh, poetic and political and deeply powerful and charged. But the process itself that gets us to that point, um, to me, is a really, really important work that is not visible to the public. Um, so the collaboration between Han and M, to me, the, the fact that um, both Han and M, they, this was a starting point and, uh, for a conversation between themselves and also for um, a project that is ongoing because artistic practice is a longer journey that is um, revisiting uh, something that they have done in the past and it builds it's cumulative and collaborative right so there's um, building up of um, the works that they have done the, the conversations that they have had and it is incredibly rewarding and also humbling as a curator to be to have played a small role in these artists um, continuing the development of their projects. So as you mentioned, Han's new novel, which I still need to get a copy of, and, um, and how that explores April 3rd. Uh, to me, that is um, evidence of a collaborative process that really seeded itself to um, become uh, something larger. And that is so gratifying as a, as a curator. Um, and Jeju Prayer, so I, I did not mention him since Jeju Prayer, except to say at the very end that he had this dream while he was working on a film about um, uh, Sazan. And that film is Jeju Prayer, as you mentioned. Um, and that uh, um, is also, again, an, an incredible um, work that he refers to uh, in that work uh, for the. <laughs> 20 minutes that I have in the, in the discussion here. I have, that, um, I have left that out of the conversation. Um, but uh, to answer the very last part of the question, um, it was so important for both Hangan and both um, Hangan and uh, Imungsun to work with teenagers because um, as we discussed, the, the, the stewards of memory, so the mothers as speakers, who, who are the listeners? There's also the, the generations that have come after and um, who will continue to come after us, um, who are part of the conversation. And uh, for both Hangam and um, Imunsen, this, this is a really an incredibly um, important part of it. Um, which again was included in the Carnegie International Exhibition, but for the purposes of this discussion, um, I've not quite made it into the 20 minute presentation. I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll answer briefly. This whole project is not really, I started this project, you know, I'm really entertaining very much of a, a lot of preliminary thoughts and very, very early stage of my research in Gwangju. Um, so, yeah, and I feel so, you know, excited and honored to have this wonderful opportunity to share the thoughts and also uh, have a feedback from Nami. One of the thoughts that I have in terms of like emancipatory vision of the repair, number one, not that I do have a like premeditated thoughts or notions walking toward, however, um, So this, you know, how can we actually leave or kind of acknowledge or revive the he very heterogeneity, heterogene heterogeneous injuries or wounds that have not really been folded into a single narrative, 
that is something that I have been thinking about. And also, how can we see still, not necessarily state-centered or state-oriented, you know, this recognition politics, how can we sort of deviate away from that a little bit, walk away from it a little? And, Okay, um, so that was the couple of thoughts and more, you know, as in the preparation for this presentation, I would start thinking a lot about representational injury and how do we think and the language. So even, you know, 40 years later and often like Hengbang Gulmyeong, we just don't, you know, see and put much of thoughts into it. But my task now, I feel, how then, as a Korean studies scholar, can then translate this missing into a Korean word? Mm -hmm. And that is where I'm at right now in terms of my thinking process. And also that is maybe the uh, vision of emancipatory vision of <laughs> repair at the moment. Should I go next? Uh, sure. I want to thank you, first of all, for Nam Healy's beautiful, beautiful feedback for all of us. And I'm really glad to be part of the other two presenters. I think it really beautifully situated, all of us like mutually situating each other. And I believe that, uh, that the potential for emancipation that I see from Chesa activism um, is precisely what Nam Healy was talking about, about this politics of time, this urge to move forward and and imagining time as if it's in constant linearity, as if mm -hmm. if something passes, it's done and we're moving forward and, and what's lost is irrevocable since we're moving forward. Um, and I believe that Chesa activism is kind of really actively countering against such politics of time, because not only in the simple sense that uh, Chesa activism is a really cyclical movement, as it uh, repeats on the same day every calendar year, but also because I believe that Chesa activism, and I believe for other presenters to all this art artistic movement or artistic representation or the idea of missing or the mode of unknown as a foundation in order to launch into a different kinds of knowing and being contemplative and reflective, I think that these modes of thoughts and the Chesa activism really avails a space to think of time as perose. And, and Lise Park was talking about how the mirroring occurs um, between um, mothers in the Mayu Plaza and uh, May mothers. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's another effort to uh, transgress this idea of national divide. Um, and I believe that this kind of thinking that tries to reconfigure um, this binary of past and present or the national boundary or living or the dead or how the dead can be the, co the source of comfort for the living, which is just so beautiful. Um, and because Nam Hili mentioned about uh, how the plethora of facts, ver verified facts actually, even with such great amount of verified facts will not <coughs> diminish or, or um, will not have any effective force in um, countering those uh, malignant voices and I believe that it's a call, and what we can get from those uh, phenomena, I believe, is really the need to sort of escape from the logocentric approach to what mm -hmm. justice means, because we already have these facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the call for Tessa Act, the uh, what mothers, May mothers are making. What May mothers are calling for, Jesa activism, is really, I believe that that it's really a call or the critique of uh, the logocentric approach to what democracy is. Mm -hmm. um, 
because what they're really calling for is the need to uh, address this affective needs of the families, which they believe were not fulfilled even after the democratic government, government of Noteu was established or the very first civilian government. There were lots of, as we all know, that there has been multiple truth commissions that have been launched, but that didn't lead to democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, democracy can be defined in many ways, but I believe that what the artists are doing and what this mode of inquiry, that spectacular, uh, you know, spec spectral reading or um, um, this generative idea of what missing can produce. Um, of course, with the caution not to be too esoteric in this you know, theoretical approach or abstract thinking, but I still believe that emancipation, the potential for em emancipation arises not so much from the facts or the positive evidence of history, but more from this uh, modes of efforts to to go beyond that, to move beyond that. And I think that Chesa activism is a beautiful illustration of how that can manifest in the form of activism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, uh, there is actually um, a comment and question, I believe, from Yongju. Uh, the conservative turn among the South Korean youth today has something to do with the refusal to engage in what Nami uh, has called the poetics of remembrance. Uh, thank you for giving the language to articulate what has so troubled me. Mm -hmm. But this refusal, to my mind, has to do with the way that the young generation feels that remembrance has been forced on them, and that what they are allowed to remember vicariously is both didactic and doctrinaire. As a member of that older generation that is seen as didactic and doctrinaire, how did our poetics of remembrance uh, fail? Did we fail to achieve poetics and end up practicing politics of time instead, mm -hmm. albeit with the best of intentions? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, Perhaps we should end our panel with that question <laughs> posed to all four of us and um, to the members of the audience. <laughs> or Yongju, um, you might want to come forward and um, possibly share your thoughts. Um, I can't really begin um, to formulate uh, our response. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just, I yes. want to say something as, as young Jew makes um, uh, their way up, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know about failure. <laughs> I, I think that is really the reason why Hung Soon, uh, Im Soon, and Hang Gang are so invested in speaking to um, high school students. Mm. Uh, in not only South Korea, but in Argentina, wherever, you know, they might learn. Um, I, I think that there is definitely, uh, I mean, they, you know, willing participants and um, uh, stewards who are waiting in line <laughs> to carry on the work, and maybe that is my extreme optimism speaking, but I really do think that um, the need for, the, the need for, um, and the desire to actually uh, change the discourse again about not only what we remember and how we, but how we remember is um, evidenced in the fact that there's so much conversation about monuments right now and uh, yes there is definitely upsurge of regressive politics um, however I do think that there is also um, a real movement of people who want to address what is happening in, in the public and how we remember in the public. Great, thank you so very much. And again and again, thank you uh, for the three uh, panel members for 
you're just wonderful and organic and very deeply um, nuanced, um, thought-provoking papers. Uh, I believe we need to conclude.